she um, has as a lady of many talents. So BC, take it away. Thank you very much for being here. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's mm -hmm. an honor to be here and to talk about our veterans benefits because we certainly honor our veterans. And I am the legal assistant to Keith Ludy. And Keith is, uh, he is an accredited BA attorney. So when you come to us uh, for advice, know that we are, are certainly in the market and, and keeping up with uh, the VA and all the changes and all that, that take place. But uh, I've been working with VA, I guess about 11 years now. And since I retired from the state of Texas and uh, Medicaid is kind of my my star because I worked in Medicaid for 31 years now. But uh, it was a, a great day when I was able to team up with Keith and, uh, and his dad was, uh, was a Vietnam veteran, a helicopter pilot. And so I think that's why we teamed up so beautifully is because all his heroes are veterans. He grew up with, uh, with veterans because his dad was in the military and uh, he is so kind and so sweet and patient with all of our veterans and uh, we, meet, we love meeting with the entire family and, and bringing them into our office or on Zoom, however it's most comfortable for them and, uh, and helping them to navigate through the systems and we always do a free intake with every family. We like for them to have everything analyzed and so that we know exactly where they can get benefits to help them get the care that they need. And uh, I'll let Keith talk first and he can kind of give you the legal background and uh, I sort of stick to the rules and he does all the legal stuff in the office, but, but he is, uh, let me tell you how kind and generous he is with his time because you can bring your legal documents in and I don't care if they're 30 years old, Keith will uh, look over those and give you any advice that you need to have regarding if they need to be updated or not. And I want you to know, we've had wills that were brought in that were 30 years old and he said, they're good. You don't need to update those. They're still doing what you need them to do. So um, I'll let Keith talk to you at this time. Okay. I guess that, that's the official handoff. Yeah. Uh, so VC, I always appreciate the, the kind words and, and I, could, I could say just many kind words about VC and, and what a blessing it is to have her knowledge and experience uh, as part of our law firm. So um, and, and to all of you who work in the senior uh, care community, uh, we, we appreciate what you do. We see it from our side over here uh, and we hear from people who come in about uh, what an essential uh, thing, services that you guys provide as well. So, uh, but talking about the, the VA benefit today, it's known, um, it's kind of its street name is aid and attendance. But if you call the VA itself, they refer to it as pension which is a much more boring name. Um, aid and attendance has been around since, uh, I mean, many, many decades. And apparently nobody knew about it. And it didn't really start getting known until about the year 2000. And people started accessing this money, which is available for many veterans to help pay for their care as they age. And of course, the more people that found out about it and began applying for it, then our lawmakers started looking at it and they decided that they wanted to change the rules around a little bit. Prior to October 18th of 2018, it was a lot easier, very, very straightforward to get, uh, to help somebody get the aid and attendance benefit. And then again, our lawmakers got involved through a few roadblocks in there, but it's still very possible and we help people all the time to do that. So um, what changed on October 18th, the, the big thing that changed with the rules was that they VA introduced a three-year look back 
on asset transfers. The, the VA program uh, is a needs-based program. So that means if you're sitting there with a million dollars in the bank, VA is gonna say, you're too rich, you don't need this. Um, but there are things that can be done for people who are over their asset limits to get them under the asset limits. But VA will say, well, after you make these adjustments, you need to wait uh, three years because they, they've introduced a three-year look back. So we tell people it's, it's more important now than it even used to be mm -hmm. to get out in front of this, to not wait until you need it, because the answer, if you wait until you need it, the answer might be, well, that's great. We can get it for you in three years. And so people need to be thinking about it now. So uh, we start off with uh, the requirements for the aid and attendance benefit. And also I wanna tell you how much this benefit is. They do, they do change the numbers slightly every year. So I, I can tell you that for a married veteran, uh, it is right around, I don't, BC, I don't know if you have the exact numbers there, but it's right around $2,200 a month that a married veteran can get. I think it's just a little bit more than that. And this money is tax-free and it is for life. So... Uh, $2,200 extra per month can make a huge difference in, in being able to afford the care that uh, an individual needs. Now, if it is an unmarried veteran, the number is uh, a little bit less. It's about $1,850 per month, give or take. $1,936. Is it up to $19 now? Well, all right. $1,936. Okay, good. So they've, they've raised it by, by almost uh, about $80. So... Yeah, over $1,900 for, for a single unmarried veteran. And for, a, for the spouse or widow of a veteran, um, it used to be about $1,250 per month, roughly. Yeah, it's $1,245 now. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so you kind of get the idea of the numbers that we're talking about. And if you multiply all those numbers by 12, you know, it, it, it comes out to fifteen dollars to $25,000 per year, which can be used to pay for assisted living or in-home care or whatever the person needs. And, and that can help to supplement an individual's income. Now, in order to access this money, of course, there are, there are hoops that have to be jumped through. And the first thing that the VA looks at is going to be the military service itself. The veteran has to have served at least uh, 90 days in the United States military, which for most military veterans, that's not a problem. And one of, at least one of those days must have been during a declared war. And they, they have a list of dates of what, you know, uh, who's eligible and, and if you serve between certain dates, like um, for some people who came in maybe like at the end of the Korean War, but left the service before Vietnam started, you know, they would not be eligible, but, um, for anybody who served during a declared wartime, whether or not they were boots on the ground in another country, they could still have served stateside. That's perfectly fine. Uh, and the military veteran also must have received better than a dishonorable discharge. So anything other than a dishonorable discharge, those are the three requirements. The 90 days total, one day declared war and better than a dishonorable discharge. So that's the first hurdle to clear. If you can't clear that hurdle, then the rest of it doesn't matter. Next, we look at the, the individual's uh, health because this particular benefit, the aid and attendance benefit is designed to help people as they age and their body begins to break down and they need more care. So one of the requirements is that the individual who's applying must get certification from their doctor showing that they need assistance with at least two of the six activities of daily living. And I used to have the ADLs committed to memory, but they're things like uh, eating and bathing and going to the bathroom, being able to get out of a bed and transfer into a chair, things like that. And it does require a doctor's affidavit to confirm that the VA is not going to take somebody's word for it. But it's been our experience that if an individual uh, lets their doctor know that they're applying 
And the doctors are, are usually pretty good about signing those affidavits as long as they're truthful, of course. I mean, doctor's not gonna say something that's not truthful, but if it's close, the doctor will usually err on the side of caution and help the patient out and sign and say, yes, um, they, they meet these ADLs. So as I mentioned before, the aid in attendance is a needs-based program. And so VA wants a lot of your financial information. They wanna make sure that you're not the owner of a diamond mine uh, or, you know, that you've got uh, three Rolls Royces parked in your garage. Um, so they're going to they're going to inquire about your income, your expenses, and also your your assets, your, your savings. And for the income and expenses, that just becomes a mathematical equation of showing that your care needs exceed your monthly income. And typically, we find that uh, a lot of our a lot of people who come into our office for help with this uh, are at the point in life where maybe they're considering selling their home and moving to assisted living, and so the the cost of the assisted living for the individual and or their spouse many times will will help to offset the income, and so the the income and expenses typically is not uh, a big hurdle to overcome. Uh, occasionally, we've had the uh, situation arise where somebody's income was slightly more than what their expenses were at their assisted living. And so our legal advice to them was, well, why don't you get a bigger room or get a private room? It'll cost you more, but it'll, it'll you know, help to, to offset that because there's not a requirement that you get the cheapest room that you can possibly get. So then the last hurdle, and this is the, the one where the le legal Doing this in a legal way is crucial, and doing it in a timely way is crucial as well. This deals with a person's assets, because VA has got a, a magic number, and the magic number changes from year to year, but it is roughly 130775 or I might be out by a few dollars, but um, just a little bit of under 131000 is their magic number for eligibility purposes. And what this number represents under VA's uh, program, to find out if you're under that number, an individual would take their yearly income, whatever that might be, if they have 50, $60,000 worth of income, and add it to any non-exempt assets. So if a person's got $50,000 of income and they've got $70,000 in sitting in, in their savings and investments and all that, their, their magic number would be 120,000 and they're good. They're under that 130,000. Many people though who come to us again are at that point where they're wanting to move to assisted living and so they put their house on the market. And here in Austin, you know, a $300,000 house is fairly average these days. Uh, some people come in and their house is four, 450, 500,000. So they are significantly over the, the magic number of 130. And if we were to, if they were to apply for the VA aid attendance benefit, VA would say, spend down your money, come back when your magic number is under 130. Well, generally speaking, people who have that type of money are smart with their money. They've been smart with their money all of their life. And the idea of going out and blowing sometimes several hundred thousand dollars on non-necessities is, is a ridiculous proposal. So the good news is that there is a remedy for it. And, and the sooner that we can start, uh, start on this, the better. That is through the use of something known as an irrevocable trust account an irrevocable trust, we can create that for the, for the individual and they can put their non-exempt assets into this irrevocable trust. And over the course of time, what the assets that they put in the trust become invisible to VA. They, they don't count against them. And again, used to be before October 18th of 2018, we could create a trust, transfer the assets, and basically they'd be eligible one month later. Nowadays, thanks to you know, uh, lawmakers doing what they do best, taking something that's not broke uh, and breaking it, it, there's now a 36 month waiting period. 
three years. So it takes three years for that, those non-exempt assets to become invisible and not countable by VA. And when I say non-exempt assets, if a person owns a house, that is an exempt asset. The minute that they sell that house and turn it into a pile of cash, that is now uh, not exempt and VA is going to count it. And since we, we meet up with a lot of people who are right at that transition stage, our first question is always, if you own a house, what is your plan? Are you planning to keep it, rent it out? Because if you rent it out, then that changes the income and, and expense equation. Um, are you planning to sell it? Are you planning to gift it to one of your children? What, what's the long-term plan? Because what we don't wanna have happen is for somebody to um, get on the VA program because their house is exempt. And then suddenly they say, you know what? I'm gonna sell my house. Well, now guess what? VA is gonna kick you off and, and you're gonna have to wait and you're gonna have to start that three-year process. If you put the money in a trust, you're gonna have to start the three-year process. So it's important to make some permanent decisions about the house before we ever get started. And um, the, the trust itself, a lot of people ask about the trust and how it works. And the thing I'd like to tell them, it's, it's kind of a lengthy discussion. We, we tailor the trust to everybody's specific needs, but um, in general terms, the, the trust, there, there are different ways of taking the assets and making them invisible to VA. And there are groups out there who advocate it, a different methodology than we use. Some of them will say, take these non-exempt assets and put them in a long-term annuity. And it essentially turns a, river, a lake into a river. So it becomes an income stream. The problem that we see with that is if you put the money into a long-term annuity, you're locking it up where you can't get to it. What happens if you need it? What happens if not only you need it, you want it. It's your money, you should have access to it. That's why we use the irrevocable trust because the money is just as, as accessible as if it was in a savings account. I mean, depending upon how much you want to take out, sometimes the bank will make you wait a few days if it's a large amount, but the money is very accessible. It's not locked up long-term. The key thing with the irrevocable trust is this. When you create an irrevocable trust and you fund it, you name a trustee, somebody who's gonna be in charge of that money. Usually most people will, will choose their most trusted adult child, who's the most responsible one, put them in charge of it. That is the person who has the key to the vault. They are the one who can go into the trust and pull money out. The person who creates the trust cannot legally do that. Otherwise it would not be an irrevocable trust. Um, and VA would not recognize it as such and the money wouldn't become invisible. So there is, a, there is a transfer of power, if you wanna say it that way, for the person who becomes the trustee. They've gotta be somebody that you know in your heart of hearts is gonna do the right thing, is not gonna take your money and run off to Las Vegas for the weekend with it. And it's got to be somebody that if you need the money, you, pick up the phone, you call them and, and they say, okay, I'll, I'll get what you need. Um, again, most people that we talk to tell us that they're, they're children, that they trust them and, and it's all fine. I know I have children, uh, my children are teenagers, but uh, if I were to tell them to do something, by golly, they're going to do it. And um, we, we always want to make an issue of it though, because occasionally we'll have somebody who comes in and says, well, you know, look, I've got two children. One of them is not good with money. And the other one is not trustworthy. <laughs> and so maybe there's somebody else, maybe there's a best friend that would be a good person to be that trustee. So what we help people with uh, primarily is to deal with this asset issue. Because again, nobody wants to sell their house and be told by VA that they've got to go spend several hundred thousand dollars. It might be fun to go on that kind of a spending spree, but how many trips around the world can you take, right? Um, the, it, wouldn't it be better to preserve your money and know that after a certain amount of time, it's gonna become invisible to VA so you can keep it and you've got one of your most trusted people that you know in charge of that money. And now 
you're eligible, hopefully, for this VA aid and attendance benefit. And so now the government is now paying you, you know, twelve, fifteen, eighteen hundred dollars, twenty two hundred dollars a month for free for the rest of your life. And it's tax free to supplement your income. So uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll take a breath here and, and address some questions. But the, the key thing is to get out in front of this and to start making plans now instead of waiting until you need it. Okay, uh, it looks like, looks like some questions. Do we have one question? Okay, um, let me address a couple of questions. Uh, one is, does aid and attendance pay for independent living? Um, typically when we get to um, a situation that, as you guys know, who work in the industry, there's different levels of care. Uh, there's independent living, there's assisted living, and then there's 24 hour skilled nursing and or memory care for, for people who are suffering with Alzheimer's. Um, generally, when somebody is at the point with independent living, the big question would be whether they have the ADLs, whether they have the two uh, need assistance with two of the activities of daily living or not. For people in independent living, um, that may be a little bit harder hurdle. Um, so it, it kind of becomes a medical question. Uh, of whether you can meet the medical component. Uh, we, we've seen people before um, who are trying to get ahead of the curve and maybe they are at the independent living stage, but they go ahead, they create a trust, they get their excess money put into the trust. They start the clock on that 36 months because in 36 months, they may be ready to transition from independent living um, to uh, some type of assisted living or, or, or whatever the case may be. So more than likely, the answer is that, that at independent living, probably not uh, eligible for it yet, but it's still a good time to plan. Um, all right, next question. My dad doesn't live with his wife anymore, but they are still married. Is he still eligible for the 2200? Okay, um, under, under Texas law, uh, until you're divorced, you're still married, even if you're living in separate places. So I can't say that we've ever had a case specifically like that, but my initial reaction would be, hey, you're married until you're not. And, and I've heard of people before being separated for, you know, three to five years. Uh, they just kind of never get around to getting divorced. And, you know, one of them will die. And, and then uh, the question about, it, are they, can they still take under the person's will when they were separated? And the answer is, yeah, you didn't divorce them. So it's, it's all... Um, there's been no legal separation, just like there was a legal union when you got married. You have to do something through the courts to, to um, dissolve that. Okay, my dad chose independent living because it's what he could afford. He should be in assisted living, okay? Um, yeah, we, we see that sometimes too. Independent living costs less than assisted living does. So um, in that type of a situation, I think that it is wise, as VC mentioned, we offer a free consultation uh, we, we don't charge just to sit down and talk with people about their individual circumstance, but we would want to look at the entire picture, including the financial picture, and try to figure out a plan. We've got a financial planner that we work with um, on a very close basis and have for the last four or five years, who's, who's also very well versed in, in how VA looks at things. And we could come up with a financial plan to try to make that transition and find a way to afford it and, and take whatever steps were necessary to get, um, to get your dad VA eligible as soon as possible uh, so that he could be moved to assisted living. So uh, what if they don't file taxes together? Again, under Texas law, and I'm not a family lawyer, but um, everything I've ever been told about family law is you don't have to file taxes together as a married couple. Most married couples do. But, um, you know, that, that you're not, again, you're not divorced until you're divorced. So, okay, that's all the written questions. Any, anybody have other, other questions or, or yeah? Oh, hi, um, thank you for that. Very informative. Um, I'm asking, can you just uh, give us a rundown of what the exempt assets would be? You mentioned house. Is mm -hmm. there anything else that you can own? Um, and, you know, I mean, that it won't really um, sure. interfere or slow anything down? 
Sure. The uh, exempt assets would include things like your, your car, um, per, one car per licensed driver in the house, um, your, your house, of course. And if you, if you go by, it's been a long time since I've looked at the list. The, the list in Texas includes like, you know, something like two cows and one goat and one pig or something. I mean, it's a, it's a list that they put together, obviously, a long time ago when our communities were much more rural. But um, generally speaking, VA is not going to come into your house and say, so tell me the value of your couch and how much does your TV cost? They're not going to count those home furnish basic home furnishings. Now, if you've got five jet skis in your backyard, uh, they're going to count that right? Because that's something that normal folks don't have. But generally speaking, they want to know about your bank accounts. They want to know about your investments, how much you keep in checking and savings. And um, so, yeah, the, the official exempt, though, uh, I can tell you that you're, because people will ask us sometimes, I had one person who came in and said, hey, look, I've got a, a fairly expensive new car that we just bought. And is that going to keep us out? And no, VA didn't put a limit on, on the amount that your car can be. You could drive a Rolls Royce if you wanted to. Um, and and that, would, that would not be a problem. All right. Well, thank you. I might add that there's a, a needs-based uh, process as well. And it depends on what your out-of-pocket medical expenses are if you're either at home or in independent living because they don't take the cost of your home off. It's just out-of-pocket medical expenses. So many times that's why individuals go to assisted living is because if their cost of care in the assisted living is $4,000 a month and their income is only $3,500, then there's an unmet need. So you would have to be paying caretakers if you're staying at home more than your $3,500 a month that your income is. And in the case of a husband and wife, we count the income of both of them. They don't give an option for one not living with the other. So sometimes that's a difficulty as well. So, um, you know, if, if there's, uh, I have had situations, especially in Medicaid, where um, because of, of abuse, one is taken from the home, but there has to still be a division of the property done legally mm -hmm. in order to meet the Medicaid requirements. And it's pretty much the same on the VA side. You know, if, if they go to, to court over this uh, case of abuse, then they can set aside uh, and give her half of the assets and him the other half. And also, uh, you know, her interest in the home, he could have to actually buy that from her if one's staying in the home and one's not. Mm. So um, it gets very, um, very difficult when you start looking at assets because you know if there's two homes if the wife owns a home and she's living in and the spouse that she's separated from also owns a home then there's not going to be forgiving two homes you know they can live together so the VA is only going to exempt the one so it it could be that they had to maybe make that a little more formal and, and be divorced if they want to, but you know, maybe one spouse doesn't want to give up the VA benefits either though. VC mentioned divorce, um, that, that reminded me, uh, occasionally we will get people who come in and with this question, and it's an important one. If an individual is a widow of a veteran, uh, they, they can be eligible for this money, but if that widow gets remarried, they are no longer eligible. So, um, you know, that, that's one question we always ask as well. Okay, so you say you were married to a veteran. Was that your last marriage? Uh, if you got remarried, um, it's great for you, but VA is going to say you're no longer the widow of a veteran that's eligible for this. 
many times they also married another veteran where mm -hmm. they could qualify possibly under the new husband's veteran mm -hmm. benefits. But yeah. all of that, you know, they had to, uh, they didn't have to necessarily be married during the wartime, but the veteran that they're getting the benefit from has to have served during that particular wartime. Mm -hmm. One other, and one other, one other quick uh, note, when we talk about creating the irrevocable trust, um, to make the money invisible. VA has got a requirement. Uh, if, if the beneficiaries of the trust, most people who set this up will say, all right, we cannot be the beneficiaries of this trust because it's irrevocable. Uh, so we'll make our children the beneficiaries of the trust. And then they'll take one of their children and make them the trustee in charge of distributing the money. If one of those children live with mom and dad, we see that from time to time, people have moved in with mom and dad or mom and dad have moved in with them. That whoever, whoever the parents are living with should not be a beneficiary under this trust because VA will say, look, you didn't really put the money out of your legal reach if you're giving it to somebody who lives underneath the same roof as you. If, if, you, if one of your children lives with you, then they're not going to count that. So one of the questions that we always ask people is, you know, look, you're you're telling me that you've got a daughter that you trust as, to be your trustee. Does she live with you or does she live in her own place? It, that's a critical component question that you want to we want to be sure to address. Um, Linda, I saw you started to raise your hand. Um, I I feel like my dad. He's a veteran. And um, he's 97, and I feel like his financial situation would meet all the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, VC mentioned the need-based process. He doesn't have a lot of expenses because he lives with me now, mm -hmm. and I'm his caregiver, and I'm very cheap. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not uh, sending the bills yet, but I would... Um, I would hire somebody. I would do things differently if I felt that it was more affordable or if I had, um, what, the 17 or the, I can't remember what, the 12, what, it, you know, what he, would, he would be unmarried, 1936 a month. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of money would um, afford me a whole lot of assistance and help with his care that I don't afford now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you already have to, be um, uh, paying for assistance yeah. or, yeah, you know, I'm kind of waiting. They have to either be in the assisted living community and having mm -hmm. that out-of-pocket expense or they have to be having caregiver expense and that has to be an out-of-pocket expense that's either mm -hmm. equal to or greater than his monthly income. What about... Um, I mean, I hear of people, I mean, I'm not anxious to get paid. He's my dad, I, but is there any way to... Um... The children can be providers. Okay. I was going to say, how can cannot. I bump up his expenses? Yeah, um... the, the, the spouse cannot, but the children can. Yeah. And uh, there's a part of the application process. There's a form in there where you have to verify how many hours and what hourly rate and what the cost is every month that you feel if that. I, wanna, I mean, do I get to decide my own hourly rate or what, how do you? Well, I'm sure it needs to be within the range of someone you would hire. Okay. So if you hire someone to maybe um, work or come and stay and help out so you get a break, um, I, would, I would look at it either by saying that uh, um, I'm getting a similar rate as what other caretakers get. Okay, perfect. VA, Linda, I want to tell you, VA will back pay um, these, these benefits. So This past year? Well, oh, no. hold on, hold on. <laughs> so, yeah. if, so if you, if, if it was something that- I'm going to do more on my, I mean, oh, right. no, never mind. So if it, if it was something that you pursued, let's say, because we're at the end of March, I'll just say, you know, first of April. Right. Um, and you began the process. Now, VA's application process, like anything, 
uh, government forms are always tricky, you know, to fill out. And it's been our experience that people will fill these out and send them in and VA will write back and say, we appreciate the information you provided. However, we want some additional information. And this can go back and forth multiple times, including and frustratingly so. Sometimes they'll say, we need this information. You're going, I've already given it to you. Um, but now they want it in a different format or on a different form. So, you know, be, be prepared for that. The, the average time, we used to tell people that the average time to get everything through and approved with all the stops and starts that they built into the system, you know, it could be four to six months. Um, there for a while after they changed the rules, they had a big influx of cases that came in right before they changed the rules. And so they were so backlogged that it was taking eight to 10 months sometimes. So, but the good news is that when you make the very first uh, filing in your application, it's called an intent. You're just letting VA know, hey, we're working on the paperwork, but we wanna stick a stake in the ground so that when you guys approve this, assuming that you do, you will pay backwards in time to this date. So the first, the first thing that you need to do is to file an intent um, and, and all the forms that VA wants are available online, you know, ser searchable uh, to find. The thing is you don't wanna file the intent until all of the ducks are in a row financially. You wanna be sure because if, if you filed your intent and the finances were not in order, to where VA was going to ultimately decline it. Again, you could wait six or eight months to find out where they're gonna decline it. And then if they decline it, they can say, now you can't reapply for another year. Mm. So- well, Probably 98 in August, Lord willing. So I, I need that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Now. laughs> I need it yesterday. Oh. I need it last year, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I emailed with VC like six months ago or something and I couldn't get the links to work. I mean, I know the forms are available online, but I think my goal is to sit down with y'all soon. <laughs> okay. Now, are you talking um, with this benefit, this aid and attendance, you're talking about the pension piece, correct? Correct. Okay, because there are other, there's also other programs through the VA as well that are not financial based yes. and are only mm -hmm. used, correct? Right. There are. Okay. There are. Okay. We don't, we don't typically assist with that. We don't okay. assist with disability cases and that sort of thing. We don't do that. All we do is the aid in attendance. Oh. Yeah, the, di disability, the disability component from my understanding uh, has to do with there's a proof element that my disability was caused by my service in the military. Uh -huh. um, and so that becomes a medical rather than a legal question. Okay, okay. Yeah, so I, I just did a meeting with the VA and that's why I was I was kind of getting a little bit confused because they were telling me it's needs based, not financial based for, for these other two programs that, that we're also working with, as well as we're doing the pension side. So, um, mm -hmm. but it was just, you had to serve, you had to be an active member of the military at some point. You didn't even have to be in a war mm -hmm. for some of, for some of yeah. these. Right. So that's, why, that's why I was just making sure yeah. I'm on the right. Easy. Yes, many become disabled from accidents or other mm -hmm. things, you know, that they're dealing with. Uh, well, they were saying they didn't have to be deemed disabled. They just have to have served in the military. It's just a VA benefit for once they get older. So even if they get Alzheimer's or if they, um, you know, just normal, normal ailments that we see out here in the community. So but that's, that's a different topic than what you're talking about. So that's yes. fine. I just want yes. to make sure. We I don't do those track. programs. We don't know all of it and we don't okay. even attempt to. But <laughs> uh, the things that we can help with are the aid and attendance program. Perfect. Which is, it, and it is a check that just goes to the veteran every month. Okay. And it's Perfect. for them Perfect. to their use and benefit, however they want to spend it, if they want okay. to spend it on their care. And there's many that have VA contracts. Now, some I have worked with, they had the same needs based and, and financial requirements as the aid and attendance program. Okay. So everyone has a different uh, VA contract. So yeah, I don't even there. begin to know about those. <laughs> okay. I, I can always uh, send them to someone I know that has a VA contract.
But if they are disabled veterans, and because I do the Medicaid side too, there are some VA uh, qualified nursing facilities that they can actually get the care they need and it doesn't cost them anything. And uh, they don't, they can have assets, they can have income. And because of the disability that they have, um, the VA contract will pay for all of that. Now, during right. all my that's years- part, That's part of what we're involved in. Yeah, sure. now part of, let me tell you, all of my years working in the Medicaid <laughs> program, I have had situations come back to where when, uh, and, and the veteran I was talking about stroked, but it was not, uh, you know, any kind of disability he had during his military service. But he was staying in a VA facility, not a VA contract facility, but in a VA facility. And uh, he was married and they made his wife uh, apply for Medicaid. Well, her dad had passed away and she inherited over a million dollars worth of assets. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't qualify for Medicaid. Oh, goodness. Yeah, without, you know, the spin down and all. Okay. I want to address a question that Maria uh, had put on here um, about, uh, this, again, this goes back to the uh, husband and wife who are separated, and, and in this case, Maria is saying that that her dad's uh, wife kind of kicked him out and took everything. Um, again, under the law of community property, any asset that they accumulated during their marriage together uh, would be community property, no matter whether she's sharing it with him or not. Um, if there were assets that she had prior to uh, marriage, obviously that could be deemed separate property, but um, that really becomes a legal question for a court to determine. Uh, many, many times people will have a prenuptial agreement or if they didn't think to get one before they got married and there was a need for one, you can do one after people are married. Uh, it's called a partition agreement. Or if they get divorced, obviously, that's part of the big divorce decree is deciding who gets what assets. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing here and the way I'm interpreting this is that um, she, she may have taken everything from him physically and thrown him out of their home. But legally speaking, that half of that community property should still be his. Now, it might take a court case for him to enforce it. Uh, it doesn't sound like he could just go up and knock on her door and say, give me my half. It doesn't sound like they have that kind of relationship. But VA, I believe, would see it as, look, they are still married. And so half of the community property belongs to him. And, um, and they're going to count because he's still married. They're, like VC said earlier, they're going to count both of their incomes and all of the assets that either one of them owns or they both own together. So... Hopefully that answers that that question. I know that's a, that's a tough situation when when you're dealing with two issues simultaneously like that, but um, I, I think that's how VA would look at that. VC, you're muted. There you go. I was coughing, so I muted myself. Um, unfortunately, when people become ill or maybe have the beginnings of dementia, these become tough situations. And I know families feel the need to take action, but if they could stay together, especially in the Medicaid program, you know, and maybe find another living arrangement for the spouse that's being difficult or ill or whatever, it becomes a, a lot easier to access benefits for that individual. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, it, it helps if they can work together. Although, like I say, through the years, I've seen everything. You know, I, <clears throat> and there's, and me Medicaid's very difficult to understand and has a lot of facets, but I had a, a lady that had transferred into one of the facilities that I uh, had assigned to me and her husband shows up at my office one day and he says, I want that spousal diversion. 
and and that is a thing and it is available but he had been in prison and he doesn't get that diversion when he's in prison and there's a specific wording to that and it's like oh what you know you're going to get back out of prison and then you're going to take your wife's money so you can spend it on whatever you want to and uh we told her there were options. She didn't have to uh, allow him that diversion, but he wanted it and she let him have it. So you have a lot of situations that arise that are maybe not the most common situations. You know, my parents were married for 72 years and, and you know, they couldn't imagine being apart. And, uh, and when my dad passed away, my mom says, I can't live anymore because I, he's just part of me. And I said, no, you still have work to do. God will take you when he's ready. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's real tough situations. They're emotional. Um, and and we, can, we can help them to see that it can all happen. We help them, they're saying, oh, how would I ever sell my house and get rid of my things? Well, I have a networking group and we have people in the networking group that that's what they do. That, you know, they make it easy for them. It makes, because it, those kinds of things become overwhelming when you've been living there 50 years. It's like, how can never do that? Plus my, my husband needs care or my, I have a disabled child or whatever. But we can help them to see that those things can happen. We, we have people that, you know, are caretakers. We have people that provide all kinds of services. And, you know, we can connect them. We'll say, well, you know, like Dura's on, in hospice. And uh, the other day I was shopping somewhere. I forgot where I was. And the young lady that was the cashier told me that she was sad. She was, uh, had lost her mom. And, uh, and I immediately told her, well, you need to get grief counseling. Um, and I said, many of the hospice companies all have grief counselors, whether you've been a patient of theirs or what. And I was asking, did mom have a, a hospice company that came to, to care for her? that they would provide that. And she said, I, get, I ended up giving her my card so she could call me to help her connect with someone. And that was when I was shopping. That wasn't when I was working or trying to work. People just seemed to tell me things. So we, you know, it's wonderful to be able to have these groups where you can help people to find, and it's usually, the best help is a disinterested party, someone you don't know that can help you to get through it and know that everything's all right and it's going to be okay. And, and that's a really wonderful aspect of working with Keith because he is so calming. He is, is so able to help them see that we can indeed get through this process. We can help them get through it. Now, sometimes if they don't have powers of attorney and other legal documents, it becomes more of an issue. But, you know, that is the number one thing we like for them to do is to come and talk to us long before you need services. Come and talk to us, get your legal documents up to date so that when somebody needs, because many times it's a fall, it's a, it's a, an emergency, medical emergency, or something that gives you the disability, and you want to be prepared for that, whether you're about to have surgery or whether you're, uh, you know, your health is declining, um, and, and that's what we like for them to do is to start planning before, and of course, most of them are not, but we love for them to start planning before they need the assistance because it makes it it makes it so much easier for them to get what they need and the care they need when they need it. A lot of people who who come into our office, um, just to kind of echo that, they either don't know what they don't know 
or they've they've heard from a neighbor or they've looked online and they've got conflicting information at a minimum we encourage people come in uh schedule an appointment come in and sit down we'll we'll talk to you we'll you know reserve some time and we can at least tell you the truth so that you can then make an accurate assessment i've i've seen people come in and they've got the wrong impression about a lot of different things because they've heard from different sources. So at least come in, let us talk to us about your situation. We'll explain all of your options to you. Um, as far as the legal fees and everything, uh, I'm a big believer in having flat rate costs on things so that we can tell you exactly what things will cost. There's no surprises. There's no you know, retainers and billing hourly and all that kind of stuff where, where people don't know exactly what they're spending. Uh, we'll tell you exactly what everything will cost. We'll give you a realistic timeline and, and work out a plan. And so then, you know, going forward, whichever, whatever you choose to do, at least it's with knowledge. So. Yes, we help them to, to see their options and be able to, uh, to direct themselves in the option that's, that's going to fit the needs of their family. Right. And uh, yeah, that's mostly what we do is provide information and we always see them for free. We let them come in and we talk to every family for free. And it's usually a couple hours because by the time you go through everything and let it kind of soak in and kind of do it in layers, it takes that long. It just takes that long to be able to uh, do the assessment for them to be able to understand in how they can take the steps that's going to benefit their family. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, then they're knowing they need a facility, but they just need someone to verify to them that, yes, you can't take care of someone 24 hours a day forever. You can't hold up to that. You've got to get some help and you can decide whether you want to have someone to come in and help or if you want to have other family members to contribute. Um, we don't see real great success with that in every situation, but with some we do. And, uh, and also to mention, you know, the, the home health agencies, uh, some do personal care, some, you know, if they've had an incident, they can be under the, the Medicare guys and, and that will help financially. Or, you know, they'll say, well, they're wanting to put them on hospice. Okay, that's a great program. Put them on hospice. I said, sometimes they do that for pain management or for a particular situation. And maybe they don't stay on hospice but they have services they can provide through the hospice agency as well as they're wonderful for end of life, you know, and that's okay. You need to have that support there that because there's, it's such a broad based support mechanism. The hospice agencies are and and I don't know why they're afraid of it. It's like, uh, that it's ordering the death of their family member if they go to hospice. And it's like, no, it isn't. Because sometimes they get better. We don't have that answer. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Hospice gives life, not death. Hospice it does. Gives life. It does. It's so wonderful. And I said, um, you know, if you're qualifying for that, take it. Take it. it even if they're in an, a skilled nursing facility, I said, you just get extra benefit always let them provide that if they can and you want what's best for your family member and you can't do it all you just can't do it all yourself it, I know it's tough for some to realize that and even when my dad passed away at 93 you know my mom was also 92 and she couldn't do for him and uh, so you know we and Fortunately, we just had a short hospice uh, interaction, but we still knew how wonderful it was to have that support there. Even when you worked in the field, when, and my mom was almost 100, she was three months shy of 100, and uh, 
when they told us we needed to call in hospice and, and we never hesitated a minute. And although I wanted to be there with her, um, I felt com comfortable with the fact that I couldn't be there. I'm old too. I can't be there every minute. <laughs> And I didn't know what to do because I'm not a medical person. So it was really comforting for us mm -hmm. to know that we had the support we needed mm -hmm. in those last days. I think just kind of big picture um, is that VC kind of touched on and mentioned Medicaid and she's going to be doing a seminar here that goes into the big uh, issues with Medicaid. But that is something that even when we do a VA case, we're looking forward to Medicaid because people tend to have greater health needs as they age. Um, and so Medicaid is always on the horizon out there. And while VA has a three-year look back on asset transfers to an irrevocable trust, Medicaid has a five-year look back. And so transferring those assets to an irrevocable trust starts both of those clocks ticking. And in every case, when we're meeting with somebody, we're talking about tens of thousands, if not sometimes hundreds of thousands, and on a rare occasion, maybe even millions of dollars that are at stake. Most people who save their money, you know, build up equity in their home, it's with the idea that they're going to have enough money for the rest of their lives. And then when they die, that they can leave something to their kids and their grandkids to help make their life better. Very few people would ever say, you know what, I saved up all my money so that in my golden years, I can, I can spend it all on my health care and, and then have nothing left when I die. Nobody's ever, nobody's ever walked in the door and told us that. So with a little bit of planning, uh, not only on the plus side, you can add more money into that bucket through the VA aid and attendance, you know, up to $25,000 a year, um, which since it's tax-free, it's really more like $32,000 a year. Um, in income and then to be able to preserve the either the, the money that represents the equity in the house or, or savings or investments or whatever else, uh, rather than have to spend down to become eligible for these programs, the ability to save that money and preserve it is, is crucial. And, and I wish that when we started all of this, we, we had kept a chart because I'd love to have that. If you know how McDonald's used to have the millions and millions served, I'd love to know how much money we've saved people over the years. I know it's in the tens of millions of dollars, I'm sure. Um, and it just doesn't have to be that everybody spends all their money and dies with nothing left. No. But you do need to start taking the steps now while you can. Um, because sometimes we'll get people who, yeah, they waited too late. And especially, especially if they are dealing with a parent who has a dementia diagnosis. Um, the best explanation I ever heard for it, I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, but as soon as you get diagnosed with dementia, the window is closing. The window of opportunity to do things legally. And it could be years or it could be months or weeks or you don't know how long. And so... If there's somebody that you run into that there's a dementia diagnosis, encourage them to come talk to us, you know, as, as soon as they can, because there are things that can be done. Um, just again, not to go into the Medicaid thing, but the um, you can own a house and get on Medicaid, but Medicaid can put a lien against that house when you die. But there are ways around that. And, and I always tell the story about a, a friend of a friend of mine who didn't talked to a lawyer beforehand, left her house to her two sons. It was a $400,000 house and it was paid off. And they thought that they were going to get $200,000 each. However, she'd been on Medicaid for a while. And so Medicaid showed up at her probate after she passed away at, with a lien of $137,000 against the house. And that's basically, you can't defeat that lien. And so her, her son's lost out on $137,000. And the good, that's the bad news. The good news is that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, if you come see us, we'll tell you about, about ladybird deeds and how a ladybird deed can defeat that lien. And we could have preserved $137,000 with a, with a one single legal document that costs, you know, I mean, not, not nothing, but it's not one of our more expensive documents. So there are ways, the more you know, you know, the better off you're going to be. 
knowledge is power. We're, we're here, we're willing to share that knowledge. Uh, we enjoy doing that, especially, especially with our military veterans, because VC and I are both children of military veterans. So we have a fondness in our heart for our veterans. And any any time we can answer any question for them, or if any of you guys have any follow-up questions that you think of after today, email us or call us or let us know. We're here. I have one question before we get off. And, and I recently was trying to help one of our patients um, on this bend down um, issue. It was with Medicaid, so I don't know if it applies the same with VA benefits as well, but I I did not realize that you, and maybe I'm incorrect in this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you can actually, uh, as part of spend down, use your money to prepay your funeral expenses and mm -hmm. family expenses. That's and true. Not, you can only buy funeral plans for uh, yourself and your spouse, or if you have a disabled child. That's the only exceptions to spending the money down. But um, when, when there's an individual, uh, we can help you with that, let me tell you, because we can save, if it's a couple and one goes in, we can save all the money for the spouse that stays at home. They don't have to spend down anything. And we do a short-term annuity in most cases it's a two-month annuity because you can transfer between spouses so if you have three hundred thousand dollars combined on your assets half 150 belongs to one spouse and 150 to the other one so what we can do is we can buy a short-term annuity for two months we can buy with the 150,000 that's for the institutionalized spouse's assets. We can buy that, spend the money down. She can meet eligibility and then the money comes back to the spouse in the community because she can transfer assets to her spouse. And so many times our nursing facilities are giving Medicaid advice. And when I worked for the state, we were sued by the lawyers because they said we were practicing law without a license as Medicaid workers. So we had to stop giving advice. There's people out there that are financial planners, they're everything, giving Medicaid advice and illegally at that. The most unfortunate thing about it is they don't know the rules. They're giving this advice and, and they really have a liability and almost all of the nursing homes give bad advice. We see people coming in that actually have a lawsuit because they got bad advice. And, uh, and some have even lost their homes because they told them they couldn't, they couldn't have a home. It's, they give them terrible advice. And they're breaking the law for filling out the applications when they're going to be the payee. And also, they don't know the rules. I worked in policy. I made the rules. I know the rules. <laughs> and I know how, and, and we don't do anything that's not totally legal. So don't think for a minute that we're trying to hide money or anything because we don't, we don't have to. The, we follow the rules that they set up. Yeah, and the if, guideline. If, if you, it's like anything, if you know the rules, um, there's a lot of things built into the system that can be advantageous, but you have to know that they exist. And we, we encourage people, come see us. We're, we're happy to share the information. Um, you know, there's no obligation. We have some people that come Absolutely. in and say, this all sounds great. Let's get started today. We have other people that say, let us go home and think about it and talk to our family. That's perfectly fine. And we have some people who listen to all of it and say, yeah, it doesn't fit us. Thanks. You know, have a nice day. And we say, have a nice day. So, yeah. And some say, well, I don't want to be on a federal program. Okay. That's fine. That's if fine. you want to use your money, you know, for, but they say, well, you don't get as good a care in a Medicaid facility. Well, the people that are doing the care are not the financial people. They don't know the payer. And they don't know who is private pay and who is not because they're not in that that situation. Yeah. 
So I don't find that to be so. And like I say, I've been doing Medicaid for 31 years. And, uh, and everyone can at least, and, and I talk to everyone. I get That's my cell phone number. If you want to save that, if you want to give me a call or have any family give me a call, I can tell them. And most of them don't need our services. They don't have enough assets that they need to buy a short-term annuity. I will help them with everything. If they just have a little bit to spend down, I can tell them how to do that. Right. I can tell them all their options. So I know we're gonna take this up at another time, but anyone that has questions, all they have to do is call me. I talk to everyone. And that's my cell phone and I talk to them on weekends, at night, whenever they get stressed because I know they need answers. And I want them to settle down and figure out that we can make this, make it all work. We can go through this and they can get the benefits they need for, the, for their family members and we can keep from breaking the bank. We can just do that. And as long as they, uh, if they get correct answers, we can make better decisions about our family exactly. members. Exactly. That's why we go to the pros here. And, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I'm the first one to say, nobody knows everything, but you know what you know. And mm -hmm. we right. want to learn from it. So thank you so much um, to both uh, VC and Keith for being here today. And I really learned a lot um, from your talk. Um, and I'm sure there will be other questions that will come up and then I will email you when they, when I think of Absolutely. them, so I get them, you know, yeah. so thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing your expertise with us. So did anybody else have any other, <clears throat> excuse me, questions or comments? Right. Okay. As always, you know, they come up after we say goodbye. So, oh, yeah, right. So, uh, they but I can call me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. And VC, we'll see you again on the eighth. You're welcome to stay if you like, um, but it, we'll move on to a couple of other events that are coming up. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, in the near future. And then actually, I think we will stop recording because I wanted to hear. Um, about any caregiving concerns um, that might be in the group. And um, all right, anything else you want to add, uh, Keith or VC? Yeah, just appreciate you having us on. Yeah, all thanks right. so, thank much. so much. All yeah. right, have a wonderful day. Thank you. you too. Bye-bye. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, all right, uh, Linda, um, and I, I guess, uh, let me see. Is everybody else gone? <laughs> Yeah, Hannah, uh, yeah, well, she was a student, so she's not a caregiver, but um, but I, I'm glad that they were here. But Linda, I want to hear how you're doing. Oh, just, I mean, day at a time, I, I feel like everything's going well, except I wish I had a magic wand to make everything, you know, appear and disappear and all that stuff now yeah. that it's pretty. Um, but uh, do you want some help with that? Oh, I, I don't. I mean, I can get help. I, I need help in my mind. <laughs> I just, I got to get off my butt some days is the problem. And I, I, I realized today, I thought, okay, I'm going to designate an hour a day. You know, I, I need to come up with a different plan. But right now it's taxes, trying to get, um, you know, all the paperwork together for that. And I can get so easily distracted. And then to hear all this great information today, I I did. I remember when I first started um, attending, because I've always been online. I've never been able to come in person, but whenever it first was, I remember getting all your good resources, and that's that's how we got pop moved with. Um, oh, I remember. Yeah, with Dura and, and Leah. Well, we got Dura, and then um, we got Leah and John, and you know, have had such good things. I remember. I don't know if I ever spoke with VC, but I emailed her and I remember getting some links and clicking on them and they took me nowhere. And I, mm. I tried to communicate with her a couple of times and I'm sure it was a busy time for both of us and VA stuff just like, eh, you know, it's just red tape and tediousness. So um, I gave up, but you know, when you hear about this retroactive and I think, oh my gosh, I gave up half a year at least, you know, what am I doing? 
um, makes me crazy because that's that's money. I mean, that is yeah. good. Yeah. You know, just. But you know what? Um, and, and I don't know about the legality of it, but I don't know why it would be illegal, but it might be worth asking. You and I are full-time caregivers. Mm -hmm. There is no, I mean, you can't count the, how many hours are there in the day because they, even when we're sleeping, we're on call. That 15 know? hour, even if you, even if you, I think $15 an hour is very cheap and, and uh, below the norms. It is. 24 hours a day, that's $360. In a year, that's $131,000. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, now. $15 if you if you were and I mean realistically speaking you know that the agencies charge generally around $25 yes, an hour. Yes. okay that's per hour now they do have a full day rate mm -hmm. they have a 24 hour or you know overnight rate usually they're two different caregivers mm -hmm. um, and you know it depends on the agency um, but if you, and I don't remember the rates uh, for the, but it can easily find out. So if you go with, I have other non-agency caregivers who have mm -hmm. kids, they will charge $15, generally 18 nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I have one local uh, woman that, um, but she can, she does so much. She can only give me like three hours a week. She charges me 13. I usually get her for three hours. I give her 50 bucks because I'm so happy yeah. to be away yeah. but yeah. that's so that and and I, and I've paid a couple of agencies and individuals a lot more than that and had to meet their um minimum and things like that yeah so part of it's my side part of it's my willingness to I don't know put up with some of the things you put up with with people in your home and the way they treat your parents and the way you want to you know things you expect and they don't they do or don't do there there's a whole lot to it but that's why i'm thinking if the va will pay me that would just be amazing i mean i would still get an outside caregiver i would i, I would research that better and try again okay. but just the fact that they'd be willing to pay me some income would lighten the load of um money you know just money yeah um <laughs> linda hang on a minute dura yeah. are you there because we're still recording dura is it? It looks like it has a line through it. Oh, does it? M mine says recording. It says recording, but I thought the circle had a little slash. Maybe not. Mine doesn't. It says recording. So, um, oh. okay, so this will have to be cut out. We will edit it out. Oh, delete this. But okay, I have two things. We may have lost her. Your help. Um, yeah, she must have stepped away or something. Maybe her little puppy. So, a, a couple things. One, um, there's a. Um, non-agency caregiver and i don't remember if i'd mentioned it or her already belki um, acosta is her name she speaks english and spanish both of them um,